Lecture 6, Instructional Leaders as Evaluators. Hi, this is Dr. Davis, and in our sixth uh, lecture together, we're going to look at teacher evaluation. Now, I know as soon as you hear the word teacher evaluation, the little hairs in the back of your neck began to stand up, as, as mine did, but I'm not sure they necessarily stand up for the same reason. I'm concerned that what we're doing with teacher evaluations really is not helping us to capture the data that we need to make important decisions about whether to uh, retain a teacher or to release a teacher. I don't think we have the information that we need to make adequate decisions about how are our students doing in this class? Are they making the adequate gains that they need to make? Well, in this uh, lecture, we're going to look at this topic of evaluation. We're going to look at some of the literature that has been written about what effective evaluations look at. We will look at the Educate Alabama model very briefly. Uh, you're pretty well familiar with it, so it probably won't uh, come as too much of a surprise as we talk about. Uh, so let's go ahead and get started. No matter what model you use, whether it is a value-added model or it's a developmental model or even a summative model for that matter, the idea of teacher evaluation is founded on three pillars. The first is uh, some amount of observation, uh, and that may be uh, by colleague teachers or a district representative and the, the building level leaders, then uh, there is some review of the achievement of the students. And then a third leg or model or, or pillar of this would be uh, some feedback from students. This is the current trend in teacher education, that teacher evaluation should be a combination of these three things. Uh, they may call them different things, but essentially they're, they're some mixture of observation, a review of test scores, and then student feedback. And the idea is that we're getting different data from these sources. And, and so basically what we think is going to happen is by using these data sources, we're going to uh, reduce some of the imperfections that people have complained about in teacher education that it was based on one observation you know a 15 minute observation by the school principal or in some cases no observation and uh, eliminate that bias that maybe is kind of built into the system uh, it also eliminates this idea that well if you're effective teachers students should be demonstrating it through their achievement and then also taking into account the customer's perspective. Does the customer, i.e. the student, uh, like what's going on in the classroom and is responding to the teacher? So this is the new model. Again, it doesn't matter what, what you call your teacher evaluation system. Most of the current systems use this configuration to support their teacher evaluation programs. What is the trouble with teacher evaluations? Well, Robert Marzano suggests in his books that the problem centralizes around these two ideas of how do we tell the effective from the ineffective uh, teacher? You know, what, what is our measure of, of that? Is, is it really the way the students perform in the classroom, how they perform on standardized tests? How do we tell? Is this person that we're st sitting in front of who's teaching a, a unit uh, on space or on planets or doing calculus, how do we tell? Is this person really effective? Well, the problem is that most of the systems that we have used historically were never designed to develop highly effective teachers. In other words, it was supposed they were supposed to be effective, and the system itself was supposed to let you know. Uh, are they competent or not? And, and that's what most systems capture. Is this person a competent person or not? But the difference between being competent and effective are two different matters. So now we come to our first substantive point. When we measure and we develop teachers, we're actually doing two different 
activities, and there is no system that can be designed to accomplish both outcomes equally. So now let's take those words individually. Measuring, that's the evaluation part of, of teaching, where we hold the teacher up to a scale, to a rubric, to some kind of uh, metric that we use, and we determine this person to be competent or we determine them to be effective. But then the other aspect of evaluation has to involve the, okay, so you're not as effective as you need to be. How can we as a school, school district, make you more effective? Oh, well, there's the problem. We don't have that component in a lot of our evaluation system. And, and agreeing with Marzano, uh, I'd have to say, yeah, there, there isn't a system that does both of those tasks well. They do one or the other. And, and so we have to think about how are we going to make the ineffective effective and maybe a, a substantive question to that is do we really need to if they're ineffective get rid of them and replace them or how do we take that effective teacher and make them better well the evaluation systems that many school districts have just is not going to excuse the pun measure up this brings us to the first question then which is what kind of evaluation system do we need in our school districts that are going to accomplish these two goals, improve teaching and increase learning. Focusing on both things. Now if you focus on the teacher and you improve the quality of the teacher, it stands to reason that you will increase the amount of learning that takes place in the classroom and subsequently increase the amount of achievement. But it's easy to say we want to create a system that will result in improved teaching and increased learning. How to do it is a different story. Let's go back to Marzano for a minute. He recently conducted a study where he asked 3,000 teachers what kind of evaluation system that they felt would be fair and result in better instruction. So now there's two goals for this particular study. They felt that the, the evaluation system had to be fair. How do you do that? And then number two, how do you increase uh, the quality of instruction? Here's what 76% of them said. They needed to measure teacher effectiveness and develop them into better teachers. So it had to be a system that did both of the things that we said are very, very if hard, if not impossible to do. So as you look at that number 76%, you go a little bit deeper into it, you find that the teachers went on to say that the emphasis of the system had to be placed on development not on measurement. doesn't say that measurement didn't need to be there. It just said the emphasis of the system had to be on the development, and that makes sense. You, f you don't constantly measure something if you want to see how well it's growing. You feed it, and you water it, and it will just amaze you. So, I have this piece of bamboo in my backyard. Now, my wife hates bamboo. I like bamboo because it reminds me of Asia and, and all. And there's this piece of bamboo that I've been watching grow over the last few weeks. Now, for, I would say, about a year, nothing happened. I had a, I had a, a bamboo plant. It was just growing nicely and sitting there and hadn't put out shoots. No, it hadn't reproduced. Well, then after about a year, I noticed this little maybe five to six inch sprout had come up out of the ground. And believe me, I know how bad bamboo can be, and, and I have to watch it, and I have to dig it up, and all that. But look at my, listen to my illustration. So in the first, I want to say three months that I observed this little shoot. Now, now, mind you, the plant, the mother plant had been there a year nothing, no expansion. It grew a little bit taller, but then just stopped. But then this little shoot came up. And I'm telling you that in the last three weeks, may I'll be more generous, I'll say in the last month, that shoot that was five inches for the previous three to four months has grown six feet in a month. And now that's not unusual for bamboo, by the way. So I've, as I've researched it online, 
in one place, it said that one particular variety of bamboo will sit in the ground for a year. It won't show any sign of growth other than that shoot. And then in the next year, it'll go 20 feet in, in a year or in three years, I forget what the statistic was. So the, the point is that if I want my bamboo to grow, I've just got to water it and make sure it gets plenty of sun and then let it do its thing. Provide the, the rich resources for it and it will grow. Uh, maybe it's a bad analogy, but it still has a connection to what we do in education. Instead of feeding our students good material and providing them with good resources and excellent manipulatives and expose them to highly qualified, energetic, amazing teachers, what we end up doing is we hamper the teacher by controlling everything that he or she says in the classroom to the point that it's almost scripted and we teach only those things that are going to be tested not those things that are just academically stimulating and then we measure the student every three or four weeks it would be like taking the bamboo out of the ground just to see how much it grew in in the previous week or two weeks and then replanting it so the emphasis has to be on the providing of excellent resources, materials, an engaging environment, an environment where students have some autonomy to study the things that they're interested in, and then learning will take place. That's really the, the ultimate um, driving force behind what Marzano found in his study. Say we created a, a system like what the 3,000 teachers in the Marzano study uh, advocated for. Here's what it would have to be. First of all, it would have to be comprehensive. And it would have to include everything that the research says results in increased student achievement and increased learning. So you'd have to go out and look at all the data on what makes students learn, what helps them to achieve, and that would have to be in there. Teachers would have to be exposed to those strategies. Secondly, it's going to have to be specific. Uh, we would have to look at the strategies that have been most uh, profitable and, and productive in increasing student learning and achievement so that we would even go so far as identify clear learning goals. This is what the student has to do. These are student expectations. Uh, and then scales to measure those learning goals so that when a student walked into their algebra class, they would know exactly what the expectations are for them, what they had to learn each quarter as they progressed through the class. And then thirdly, there would have to be some kind of rubric or scale uh, that would be used uh, to help this teacher progress, not just using uh, what a lot of times these quasi-developmental systems use, the beginning, developing, applying, and innovative. It would have to be comprehensive, specific, and have a rubric where, students, where teachers could look at, okay, this is what mastery is okay and I can I can see what I'm gonna to have to do to get there and a development system would have to include some kind of reward for growth uh, now now I realize that you know we want intrinsic motivation and yet there are still teachers who, who are driven by extrinsic uh, motivation so I understand that but the teacher would would be able to identify the area that they were going to demonstrate the growth. That's what they were going to focus on during the year. And if there was growth in those areas, then there would be some kind of reward. Now, whatever level the rubric is you whatever rubric you use whatever level system you use your goal is to see them go from where they currently are to where they need to be and so based on the data you would you would have available to you you would know what areas that teacher needed to work on maybe it is classroom management or it's rapport or, or something like that then if the teacher 
I could say this is the I meant at the beginning level to use that word, and I want to get to applying. Okay, I know what I'm going to have to do to get there. Then what kind of reward are we going to create for them when they do get there? And and that's part that's got to be part of a development system. It does have to have rewards. People like them. I mean, that's people say, "Oh, you should just do it because it's the right thing to do." Yeah, you should. But it's also nice to reward them when they make those milestones. And then the goal then of this system is to develop great teachers. And I think you'll find that if you allow them to be involved in choosing where they're going to work, uh, the areas that they're going to work on to improve. And then reward them when they do improve those areas. You'll have a great system. No matter what kind of system you develop, you're going to have to have some observations uh, by school leaders or by district personnel because you, you need to collect the data, uh, the real time data of what's going on in the classroom. Not looking at test data. Test data is historical. Test data tells you how things were in the classroom or in some cases the data that we use in class tests and whatever those are snapshots of a day that's no longer taking place what we need to do is to collect real-time data and that's where classroom observations come in uh, that's the real-time data now why don't they work I mean, I've already told you that in many cases uh, principals don't conduct enough evaluations and and there's a lot of suspicion about the value of a, a principal observation so here's here's some of my thoughts on why they don't work well there are leaders who go in with their preconceived ideas about what a functioning classroom should look like you know for some of those guys and gals they, it has to be a quiet classroom that there's not a uh, a student out of place every student's in their desk and every student's working on something i'm not saying that that's how i want my classrooms to be because i think there's a lot to be said for uh, a noisy but well-managed classroom where the students are engaging one another on course content and and things like that and, and when you're doing that you are learning it may be noisy compared to, to what some people have said and, and what I've heard from principals yet there's a lot of learning taking place another reason that principals uh, don't always get as much out of evaluations or observations as they should is because they lack the content knowledge uh, they are coming into a classroom where maybe they were uh, an elementary teacher and they're now in a middle school and they really don't know the upper grade level curriculum like they should uh, some of them lack instructional knowledge and that's what's even probably more scary where your principal should be your lead instructor in the school some of them were never really stellar instructors when they were in the classroom themselves and, and they have carried that deficit to the principal's office uh, this is probably by far the, the most important reason why uh, we miss effective teaching through our uh, observations. And similarly, we just don't do enough of them. I know of teachers who could tell you right now that they have not been uh, observed in three years. They've not had someone from the district, a colleague, or their principal come in and observe them teach in three years. Well, how can you know what's going on in that classroom by not visiting. I don't know how you complete the the reports that, that need to be completed as part of Educate Alabama. That's just one reason. But another reason is when you go into that classroom, do you really know what you're looking for? Can you differentiate beginning to a developing use of a particular strategy? I can't. I mean, you may have a strategy that you want to see employed, but can you truly say, based on your observation, that this is a, a innovative use of a particular strategy? You really can't, because you can't see the impact of the strategy in just that one setting. You need other data besides that. Obviously, test data and, and, and other data would help you know, has this strategy been effective? But most people cannot go in and differentiate between an effective use of a strategy and not. All they see is a teacher using a strategy and, and that's it. Learning to observe is not intuitive. You do need to be trained on how to 
observe, to what to look for when you're conducting a teaching observation. And uh, being able to write down exactly what you're seeing happening without interjecting your opinion uh, about what you see. So that you can document uh, things that are environmental as well as as what you see the teacher doing. What, what are the students doing uh, in response to what the teacher's doing? And your job is to write down evidence, not, as I said, write down your opinion. Well, let's stop here and, and look at what is evidence. Well, evidence is the things that the teacher says. The actions taken by the students and a description of the room. What's how the room is set up, how it's laid out. But at no time is there ever an interpretation of what is meant by what has been observed. You see, that isn't the job of the principal. And you'll hear this in evaluations all the time. The principal will say, I noticed that uh, Oh, 10% of your students appeared to be bored with what you were saying. Now, that is a judgment. That is a conclusion. And also, that is an opinion. The other way to say it is, I noticed that there were 10% of your students who were off task. You had told them to do A and they were doing B. That's evidence. Now, in, in conducting post-interviews with teachers, it is my job as the evaluator to present the evidence of what I've observed. But it is the job of the teacher to then ascribe meaning to that. Why? Because I didn't see what preceded my entrance to the room and I didn't see what followed when I left the room. So you see, I can't really adequately provide any interpretation of what's going on because I wasn't there long enough. All I can tell you is what I saw when I was there. And again, my job is not to present judgment or draw conclusions. My job is to present the evidence. And then the teacher, when presented the evidence, is responsible to say, okay, what are you going to do? How are you going to respond? Not, here's what I think you ought to do. Uh, I think you need to change what you're doing. No, 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 no. Your job is to just to let them see the evidence. And then their job is to look at the evidence and decide how they're going to proceed. What are they going to do? And then you look at ways that you can be the resource for them. So what can I do to help you? You've identified these things went on. This is what they mean. Great. What kind of things can I provide you that will help you uh, as you change what was going on in your classroom? Kay Marshall is one of those educational leaders who advocates eliminating the announced observation visit, what she calls the dog and pony show. She says that if you tell the teacher when, when you're coming to observe, the teacher is just out of the pressure of the observation, going to put on a dog and pony show, which has no bearing on what goes on in that classroom from day to day. Teachers will tell their students, okay, the principal's coming today, observe me. So you know what to do. And the, the teachers and the students wink at each other. Teacher puts on this great little model lesson. Students behave like little angels, like they are. And they ask questions, and they're engaged. And the principal looks at it and says, this is a marvelous teacher. And what happens is when you announce your visit, basically uh, you get inaccurate observations, inaccurate data, because it's based on a, uh, an, an unreal circumstance. And to a sad degree, you're encouraging teachers and students to be dishonest with what's really going on because they are afraid of the evaluation process because for most cases evaluations are negative evaluations are scary that's why people don't like them because it's not about building them up it's not about developing it. it's about judging them when we take judgment out of evaluations what we end up with is a system that allows us to say 
what can we do to make you better? We're saying we're not saying that you're not good. What we are saying is we just want to make you better. How can we do that? And why to get rid of the dog and pony show? Because basically anybody can put together a stellar lesson. If I know the dean's coming, you better know I'm putting on a stellar lesson for him. Uh, but the question is, how do I behave? You know, when he's not there. What, do, what about the next day and the day after that? You see, that's true of even K-12. You, you can put on a great lesson, but what about the day after or the period after? Okay, Marshall advocates getting rid of the, the announced visit, replace it with unannounced visits. And she says that what we need to do is stop these infrequent visits and replace them with more frequent visits. Here's what she says. She says we need to spend less time per visit. Now that's hard to understand because we don't spend enough time as it is. But in her, her way of seeing things, she says what we actually do is when we visit less but do it more often, we ultimately get more observation time. And she says this. She says that most annual observations, if you do one a year, you basically are going to get about an hour, if you get that. And that's 60 minutes. But what she says, if you'll spend just 15 minutes, but do it 10 times a year, you're going to get 150 minutes, which is twice what you would get with the regular annual observation. So she says it's it's kind of like the Walmart principle. You know, sell more for less. She says spend less time, just do it more often, and you'll get even a better result. And she says that each uh, visit should be followed up with a conversation with that teacher. Again, remember I told you about that the job of the principal is to present evidence, not opinion, and not judgment, and that's what should happen at uh, a follow-up conference. The teacher is the one who should hear the evidence and, and, and I would say give the evidence to the teacher before the meeting, long time before the meeting, and then when the meeting comes that's when she gets to do the talking. She or he does the talking about what does it mean. That's where she explains what was going on and, and what was happening. Not in a way of excuse me for what I did or what I didn't do. It's not about blaming others or deflecting blame. It's about saying this is what, what's really going on. This is what it means. Does this sound like a walkthrough to you? It does to me too. But the difference between this and a walkthrough is that your focus is on the instruction, not on the room. You're looking at what the teacher is doing, for the most part, and how the students are responding to it. That's your only job, looking at gathering data in those two areas. So I, I like walkthroughs, and I believe doing lots of them are, are a great idea, but walkthroughs need to be focused more on looking at the instruction. Now, Dr. Milner, who is uh, the superintendent down at Saraland, when he was an enterprises superintendent, uh, and before he was superintendent, I mean, when he was at, uh, I believe it was Dauphin is where he was uh, beforehand, he used to do these walkthroughs. And he had a little checklist that he followed. And when I was talking with him in those years, and this is some years ago now, I was talking to him about how that he could turn those morning walkthroughs into part of his observation. And he did it, and he said he found that he got much better data, because he got more data. It was real data. It was relevant. It wasn't based on just a one-time visit. It was based on the visit last week and the week before. And he made it so that he could visit in a week all of his teachers twice. And now that, I think it was about 60 or 70 teachers that often at the time, that's not easy to do and still be the principal. But yet he was able to get that done by just doing those little 10, 15 minute stop by, look in the door, watch what's going on, and step back out and go on to the next room. And so here we talk about the follow-up meetings. Uh, there are two, two roles in this meeting, the observer and uh, the role of the observer, of course, is to provide the, uh, the items that were seen and heard. 
The observer is the one that gives his or her notes to the teacher prior to the meeting and asks the teacher to add to the notes anything that was missing. You know, sometimes you, you miss a, a piece that's very important. And this gives the, the teacher a chance to say, but you didn't catch this. Oh, okay, well, let's add that to the notes. And, and so see, now you become partners in this. You become partners. And it's not about me coming in and judging you. It's about me saying, okay, this is what I saw. Here's my evidence. Now, let's make sure I got all the evidence I was supposed to get. Okay, no, you added these things. Great, put them in the notes. Then the teacher takes over and provides the significance to what went on. And the observer then asks, well, what could we do differently? What could you do differently to make this even better? Teacher then responds with, well, these are some things I, I, I'm thinking about trying. The principal or the observer says, well, here's some other things to try. And you make it a point to say, okay, uh, and this is part of the observation follow-up notes, which is to say, okay, teacher is going to try this strategy, strategy X, in the next uh, two weeks. You, you identify the strategy. You identify the suggestion, you put a timeline on it to say, okay, when are you going to do that? Okay, great, got it down. So that the observer then comes back in two weeks and observes that strategy uh, in action. And then, again, collects data on how things are better. You see, that's the kind of relationship that can be had in an evaluation when the focus of the evaluation is not on judgment but on development. Value-added models are very, very common today. Tennessee has one, Florida has one, um, Alabama kind of toyed with the idea of going towards that value-added model, but here's basically what they are. It's a specific type of growth model uh, that examines the teacher's impact on students' achievement progress so that achievement scores are considered part of the evaluation. A lot of this was influenced by uh, race to the top money that was under the Obama administration and so states had to develop these value-added models that said listen we, we want effective teachers but if this test scores are not improving then how are we really you know impacting student learning? Uh, like I said, in Florida, they use a value-added model that where about 50% of the evaluation is based on achievement scores. Now, in Tennessee, I think it's only about 30%. Uh, or 25% and then the rest of the evaluation is based on observation and then uh, a very small percentage is based on student feedback. At the elementary level I think feedback is is ludicrous not because they don't know anything uh, but unfortunately uh, they're not necessarily able to identify things that should be measured. Well, it, it became popularity kinds of things. Oh, I like my teacher. She's great. Or if I didn't like the teacher, I'm going to rate him or her very low in this area and give very poor feedback to him. So, again, those, those have been weighted less, but they're still there and, and can be very demoralizing to a teacher. Those who oppose these value-added models say, you know what, they're just not reliable because we're using a lot of subjective data uh, we're, we're using student feedback. Uh, it, it highly is uh, dependent on excellent observations. Uh, and basically what, it's, what their complaint is that there are just so many factors out there that can influence standardized tests that how can you even use them with any kind of reliability. But, but those who are in f support of them say that teacher evaluations are meaningless without test score data because you're saying, wait a minute, what is it that the teacher's doing? What value does the teacher bring to the classroom? And that really is the substance of the value-added model is to say, wait a minute, if the teacher isn't bringing anything that's positively impacting the classroom, then why are they there? So, uh, those who also support it talk about if goals, a goal of teaching is learning and learning is measured by test, why not use them? But see, here's the difference. Achievement is different than learning. Remember I told you in a previous module that learning is a process. 
it doesn't follow a set schedule. It's not linear. It happens and we don't always know why it happens. We don't know the forces that shape learning to take place. And I'm afraid many of us don't know what learning is when it does take place. We can't always identify, oh, that's learning. I see it right there. That's learning. And, and so, therefore, if we don't know what learning really is, and we don't know when it takes place, and it's very hard for us to identify an example that it actually has taken place, you can't compare it to achievement. Achievement is an event, not a process. This is uh, Rigoberto Ruales. I want to tell you about his story. He was a fifth grade teacher in uh, the Los Angeles Unified School District. He taught at Miramonte Elementary School, which was an extremely high poverty school. Uh, this was a school where it was Spanish speaking and English learning. So these were all pretty much ELL students. He knew that in order for his students to be successful, they had to learn the language. So he took it upon himself to tutor these struggling kids. Many of these kids had parents who were working two and three jobs, fathers who weren't present. So he becomes almost like a second father to these kids. He would get to school long before he had to and stay long after he had to to tutor kids out of his own money. He paid to provide books and materials for these kids. By all accounts of his colleagues, he was a star teacher at Miramonte Elementary School. But that's not the whole story. Now, here's the rest of the story. The uh, LA Times published an evaluation scores of all the teachers in the school district. They did like many newspapers. They wanted to make sure that every parent knew which teachers were effective, which teachers were not effective. Now here's what they did. They released the name of the teacher and their class's achievement scores, the average score. Here's the thing. Uh, Rigoberto Ruales was rated less than effective on his ability to teach English. Now this guy's killing himself to teach English to these kids. His family said that he became so despondent he committed suicide. And they believe that his suicide was related to the value added measures assessment that California uses. I don't know if it, it was solely that but it may have been a contributing factor. Now I'm not saying that this is an epidemic where teachers are killing themselves because of value-added scores, but in cases like this it makes you wonder. Here's a guy who, by all measures of his colleagues, by the, any measure that his students, when they were asked, they thought this guy was phenomenal. They were devastated when this guy committed suicide. Not saying that evaluation systems have this kind of impact on all teachers, but in this case, it, it had very disastrous effects on this one man. Let's tackle the question, should students rate their teachers? It's been done in higher ed for, for years and years and years. But when it was suggested for elementary and secondary, there was always some kind of hesitation. And basically the response that the teachers or the administrators gave was, was just the students were not mature enough to make those decisions. The reason that maybe these uh, responses by or ratings by students are not effective is because we do not have an effective rating system. Not that it's, they're not mature enough, but that we're not asking them the right question. I referred to this Measures of Effective Teaching project uh, and, and Robert Marzano's uh, involvement in it. Uh, this particular project was funded by the Gates Foundation. They used what was called the Tripod Student Survey, and they, they brought this survey into 3,000 classrooms. And basically, the survey is to students, and it's written in age-appropriate language, and it asks them to rate their teacher on these seven areas, care, control, their ability to clarify, challenge, captivate, confer, 
and consolidation. And you say, well, those words don't make sense. How can a third grader understand those? Well, let's look at those words in more depth. So the first one, care, refers to creating an emotionally and safe learning environment. Control, managing the learning environment. Clarify, teachers who are able to explain difficult concepts. Challenge, the material is rigorous, students work hard and think hard. Captivate, instruction is engaging and stimulating. Confer, teachers who seek the student's point of view calling on them in class and then consolidate where you check for understanding, reviewing, and summarizing material. Now students can evaluate their teacher on these areas, and really they're evaluating what's going on in the classroom. They can tell if that classroom is an emotionally safe place, that they really want to be there, that the teacher ha controls what's going on, manages that learning environment so that it is a safe place. Uh, they can answer whether a teacher uh, seeks their point of view, their opinion on something, or calls on them in class, and then summarizing and uh, checking for understanding. So these were the seven areas that teachers were evaluated on with this uh, MET survey. Is it an, a valid measure using the student feedback that was obtained from it? Now this is a bit dated, I haven't looked at it since, but according to the 2012 MET report, the survey was substantially more accurate in predicting gains on value added measures than classroom observation. It did a better job of predicting teacher uh, student achievement than the classroom observations did. Some of the reason may be due to the fact that students, get this, spend hundreds of hours with their teacher and the principal might only spend two or three hours. Well, if you want to play the devil's advocate, the principal, he or, he or she, knows what to look for and the students don't. Here's the thing. The reply to it is, based on the, the 2012 MET report, it appears that what the principals were observing and noting does not have an impact on student achievement. And what the students were observing did. Let me hit that again. You may argue that principals know what to look for because he's a professional educator. He knows what to look for and students don't. But in response, what the principal may be looking for doesn't really impact student achievement and the things the students were noting, the care, the challenge of the rigorous environment, consolidation and the rest, did have a significantly stronger impact on student achievement. Are any of the seven C's more uh, important towards student achievement? Are they a greater predictor? Well, according to the MET survey, teachers who had the highest rating in the following areas also had the highest performance on their standardized test. Control, challenge, and clarify. Control, managing the environment, Two, challenge, uh, creating a rigorous curriculum. And then three, being able to make complex subjects easier to understand. Those are powerful skills. If a teacher can do just those three things, manage the environment so students can learn, and then explain difficult concepts, achievement should be a breeze. So the MET survey went on to show that the highest performing classrooms were the ones that were most orderly and most respectful. Again, not telling us anything we don't already know as teachers, that when I have an orderly classroom, it's organized, the materials are right where they should be, I've got a schedule, I know what I'm doing and when I'm doing it, you're going to find student learning is taking place and achievement follows. Now, in all fairness, the survey said all seven of the uh, C's related to increased uh, improvement or increased performance on uh, student achievement tests. But the control, challenge, and clarify seem to have the most impact of, of those. So I don't want to overemphasize just those three. All of them together impact uh, student achievement. What about the Alabama model of teacher evaluation? 
called Educate Alabama. Here's what we do know. It's, it's a formative model. Uh, so it, it isn't summative, it's not an evaluation, it is formative, so it's about teacher learning. Uh, it does follow the value-added models or the growth models where we're trying to take teachers from uh, lower performing levels to higher levels and increase their ability to teach, increase the quality of their teaching. Because we know there is a relationship between the teacher growth and student growth. When we have teachers who are growing intellectually, they're learning more about their craft, they're improving their ability to teach, then we know that that rubs right off on students with increased learning, and then because of increased learning, we see increased student achievement. You know, the formative part of this, and I'm not going to go into a great deal of depth with Educate Alabama. If your district isn't using it, I can't imagine it wouldn't be. But uh, you know that the first part is the formative, where I do a self-assessment, where I think I'm at. Then I have dialogue with my colleagues, uh, where I talk to them about where, where I'm at, and, and they give me feedback. Um, they help me to clarify where I'm at on the, the level. Uh, and then I do uh, a professional learning plan. I outline the things that I'm going to do to increase my capacity to be an effective teacher. Then, once I have done this, uh, and this is done at the beginning of a cycle, I think it's a three-year cycle, but when I've done this, uh, my job is to gather supporting evidence to show, yep, I've done this and I've completed this training and I've seen this growth in myself and in my students. And so I, uh, basically, it is formative in that it is helping me improve because I'm doing my own study, my, I have my own learning plan, and then I have evidence to support the conclusions that I'm drawing from it. Why do we use it? Well, the purpose of the, the plan is basically that we want every child in the state taught by a well-prepared, fully resourced, and supported and effective teacher. That's the goal. We don't want some students to have well-prepared, resourced, and supported teachers. We want every child, and every child deserves that. There shouldn't be cases where, wow, uh, the teachers at this school are not as good as the teachers at the school down the road. Or the teachers in this neighborhood school are not as good as the teachers in that one over there. You're right, and we shouldn't have that because that's not what we're about. We want every child to have an awesome, awesome teacher. What separates the Alabama model from others is there is a summative portion to this uh, model, this growth model, because we do look at how have the students grown as a result of the teacher's teaching. We do look at student achievement scores, and we look at their own professional growth as teachers, their professionalism, what uh, I observe in the classroom how, as a teacher, that's the, the principal's observation. Uh, I observe their working relationships with their colleagues. We give them 360 feedback. That's, so that's feedback from us, the administrators, from their colleagues, uh, you know, from parents and from students too. It becomes a, a large group of people working together to make this a better teacher. So there is a summative portion to this model as well. So why does it contain both formative and summative uh, components? Well, first of all, you have to look at, at formative and a summative uh, component. Each has a different purpose. A formative uh, component is all about developing. We want to develop this teacher into a better teacher. A summative, develop, uh, a summative component looks at, so how well did we do? We attach a value to what they were able to accomplish or achieve. So notice in the goal of formative is to gather feedback to be used by the instructional leader and educator to guide professional growth with the hopes that this guidance is going to help them positively impact student achievement. Formative components are typically reflective because it's you deciding what you're going to do to growth based on the data that shows where you need to grow. Uh, the other thing is it 
really looks at a lot of dimensions of educator practice. It's not just about the instructional moment, but it's about how the, the whole classroom is led or managed. It's you know the kinds of questions you ask, how you engage the students, how you bring them into the learning environment, and then how you extend that learning. Formative is, is two-way communication. Of course, you can't have communication without it being two-way, so that's kind of redundant, I guess. It's communication, where teacher and principal are communicating about how to improve the teaching that's going on. It's not one way where the principal is just telling the teacher, you do this, 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 and this. Now, a summative component, and that's what we've brought it in, measures the level of success or proficiency obtained by the teacher. So we want to say, well, this is what you did at the end of the school year or at the end of the cycle. This is where you were so that you know where you need to go to improve beyond that. Uh, there's got Because it's summative, we have to compare it to some kind of standard or benchmark. That's where the rubrics come in. Uh, we, we typically, when it's summative, we assign a rating to them and say you're at this uh, developing level and you need to move on to application. Where a formative model, the uh, initial assessment takes place during instruction, during the process, the summative takes place after it's occurred. So nothing more can be done. That's why we try to combine both of them into this uh, evaluation model because we don't want to just evaluate at the end the summative well that you know, we can't change anything that way the formative changes a moment by moment by moment and it's probably the most beneficial because it, it helps us to look at what we're doing as teachers and say well I need to make a change right now I'm not gonna wait till I get the test scores back from the student I'm gonna fix the problem now, I say I didn't teach that well and I need to reteach it because the students aren't grasping what I'm saying. So I'm going to make immediate course corrections instead of waiting till after the summit of evaluation and say, yeah, I really should have changed. I should have done something differently. Well, by then it's too late. So this brings in both dimensions, allows for course correction and then adding a value to what uh, the teacher was doing. Are we ever going to get teacher evaluations right? Probably not. We're going to constantly make them better uh, and, and more user-friendly. And, and maybe we'll arrive at um, making them less threatening and more beneficial to the teacher. I think if, if we make teachers a partner in the evaluation process, that would be a huge step. A lot of models out there. There's a lot of articles written on teacher evaluations every year in pretty much every journal that you see. And, and there's still the ongoing debate whether we're doing it right or doing it wrong. But in this lecture, what I've tried to do is kind of present some of the current thinking, which is the value model, value added model, and then also talk about some things I think we need to do differently. And that's citing K. Marshall's uh, work, get rid of that announced visit, go completely with those 15-minute kind of walk-through type uh, observations. Well, I hope this has been helpful to you in at least getting you to start thinking about the evaluation process. You're going to be involved in this as an assistant principal. You're going to be involved in... Uh, observations and I hope you'll remember this as you do the observation and maybe you'll try uh, those little walkthrough visits and, and if you do let me know how that's going I'm just curious to see what you find as you do it I think you can make an impact because remember the goal is making better teachers if we make better teachers we'll see increased learning and and students who, who are able to achieve well I hope you have a great rest of your week and uh, contact me via email if you need me and until our next time take care